Welcome to Congress. Congressional debate, or just simply Congress, is a speech and debate event where you get to simulate being a member of the U.S. Congress. And while you won't have the opportunity to hit the campaign trail or take lobbying money from corporations, you will have an opportunity to speak and vote on legislation that Congress would consider in real life. Congress is unique because it's both a speech event and a debate event. You're judged not only on the quality of your speaking, but also on the strength of your arguments. And mastering both is difficult, but Congress also has the shortest speech times of any event. And unlike most other speech events, it's normal, and in fact it's almost expected, that competitors bring a legal pad up with them for reference. As a result, Congress is the easiest event to learn, but the hardest event to master. This video is going to give you a guide of what to expect at every stage of a Congress tournament, from the moment you start preparing the legislation to the end of preliminary rounds. And while this video is mostly designed for beginners, there are also details here that will be useful even to people who've been competing for years, making this a good resource for anyone interested in congressional debate. Let's go! Most other debate events, like Public Forum, Lincoln Douglas, or Policy Debate, have one topic that everyone in the country debates for a specific amount of time, usually at least a month. Congress is very different from this, because instead of every debate in every part of the country being on a national topic, in Congress, our topics are based on legislation. Not only does the legislation you debate change from tournament to tournament, you'll also debate multiple different pieces of legislation every round. And in most tournaments, the legislation you debate also depends on your chamber, or the group of debaters you compete with. I know that this can sound like a lot, but remember that unlike other events, where you have to prepare enough material to speak for up to 16 minutes per person, for each piece of legislation, you only have to prep one three-minute speech. So the workload ends up being about the same, if not a little less. Not to mention, because you're getting exposed to so many different topics, you're probably going to leave Congress with a much better understanding of the world than most of your peers at school. I honestly learned way more in Congress than I did in most of school. Also, Congress is basically a cheat code for AP Gov and AP Lang. So the very first step of any Congress tournament is reading the legislation so you know what you're debating. And there are three kinds of legislation that you could get. The first is called a bill, which is a piece of legislation that changes or creates US law or allocates congressional financial resources. Bills are the only kinds of legislation that can provide funding or change U.S. code, which is basically the list of all federal laws. The second kind of legislation is called a resolution, in which Congress resolves to take a specific action or recognize a specific fact. Resolutions are usually just Congress's way of saying, we will do something in the future. For example, the only way for Congress to ratify a treaty or declare wars through a resolution. Likewise, if Congress wanted to recognize the Kurdistan regional government as an official nation, that would require a resolution. The third and final kind of legislation is called a constitutional amendment, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a resolution which amends the Constitution. Unlike other kinds of legislation, which can pass with nothing more than a simple majority, that is, anything more than half of the vote, to pass a constitutional amendment, you need something called a supermajority which is more than two-thirds of the vote. And that changes the way votes get counted, even in congressional debate. Remember, at the end of every debate, you vote on the legislation. And if a constitutional amendment doesn't get two-thirds of the chamber support, it doesn't pass. By the way, don't worry about being on the losing side of a piece of legislation. You're not going to be judged at all based on whether or not the overall side you were on won the debate. If you want to get a more thorough idea of how to read, write, and understand legislation, please watch our Where to Get Started with Legislation video. So now that you know what you're debating, it's time to prepare, or prep for short. Every bill will have two sides to it, the affirmation and the negation, or af and neg for short. The affirmation wants the legislation to pass, and the negation wants the legislation to fail. Unlike in other debate events, in Congress, you always get to pick which side of the bill you speak on. 
and you should always prepare to speak on at least one side. I say at least because it's a good idea to prepare to speak on both sides of the legislation in case the debate is very one-sided. That way, if the debate is AF heavy or overrun with speakers in the affirmation, you aren't lost in a crowd of other AF speakers, and vice versa for neg heavy debates. Getting lost in the crowd is particularly bad in Congress, because the more speakers who go before you on your same side, the more likely it is that someone else makes your exact same argument before you get a chance to. And if that happens, you shouldn't try and make the exact same argument again. When someone makes exactly the same argument as someone who came up before them, we call that rehash. Judges hate rehash because it's boring and it doesn't contribute anything new to the debate. To avoid rehashing, it's a good idea to prepare more than what you'd need for a single speech. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. In fact, though I absolutely don't recommend this, you could prep nothing if you really wanted to. Congress is the only event where you don't have to speak on a bill if you don't want to. But to do well, you should speak once on every bill you can. Now, believe it or not, the first stage of prep is not writing arguments. In fact, as a rule, I would say that you shouldn't start writing arguments until you've done at least an hour of background research, especially for a topic you've never prepped before. And that background research occurs in a couple of steps. The first step is writing a legislative summary. Basically, write a bullet point list of all the things the legislation actually does. This prevents a problem that happens even in high-level debate rounds, where people just read the title of the legislation and assume that's exactly what the bill does. And as many people, including myself, have learned the hard way, that's not always the case. The second step is doing background research on the legislative topics. This does not mean you have to know everything about everything, though that might help. All it means is you need to understand at least the relevant laws, the relevant history, and the surface level arguments on both sides of the issue. For example, if you're prepping a bill to sanction Israel for putting settlements in Palestine, you don't have to know about every war fought between Israel and Palestine or the intricate details of the Israeli governing system, though that might help. But you do need to understand what sanctions are, along with the surface level arguments people make about sanctions, as well as a brief history of Israeli settlements in Palestine, along with the surface level arguments people make about those. The third and final step is keeping a record of useful evidence. If you get even a small sense that one of the sources you've looked at might be useful to refer to in the round, or to cite in your speech, keep a record of that card, along with the website URL, in some word processor. I'd highly recommend that your word processor of choice be Google Docs. A, because it allows you to collaborate with teammates or friends, and B, because it automatically backs up all your prep to the cloud, so if something happens to your computer, you don't lose all your prep. Also, when I say card, I just mean a piece of evidence. I, I swear, debate people shorten way too many words. You shouldn't assume that you'll get a chance to do this research at a tournament. For one thing, some schools and places where tournaments are have bad Wi-Fi, so it can be really hard to connect. And on top of that, some tournaments don't even let you use internet. So even if the signal is good, sometimes you won't be allowed to use it. So this is all work you have to do before you get to the tournament. If you want more resources on prepping, check out our recorded lectures on where to start with legislation and unique argument creation, as well as our live efficient prepping lecture. That last sentence just gave off big uh, like, comment, and subscribe energy. I know 99% of people in the comment section won't give my videos a chance. But if you just give them a look, I I'd be so appreciative. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop this. I'm even irritating myself. So now that you've done your background research, you can actually start writing speeches. So, what does a speech look like? Well, Congress speeches have a three minute time limit with a 10 second grace period. Most debaters take that 10 second grace period, effectively increasing the speech time to 310. But it's completely possible, and in fact it's recommended, to finish your speech in only three minutes. And like most argumentative prompts you've written in school, every good argumentative speech has an intro, a body, and a conclusion. In each part of the speech, you're expected to do a couple key things. Let's go through what to do in each part of the speech, starting with the body. The body of most Congress speeches is made up of two arguments, which are sometimes called points or contentions. Each argument is expected to follow something called a CWDI structure, which stands for Claim, Warrant, Data, Impact. 
A claim is exactly what it sounds like. It's what you're claiming the legislation will do, and a reason you're advocating either for the affirmation or negation. For example, a claim would be, first, pass this bill because it reduces income inequality. The second part of the structure is the warrant, or a brief explanation of why your claim is correct. Your warrant always comes right after your claim, and it's usually phrased like, so first, pass this bill because claim, and that's because warrant. So if the claim I made earlier was for an AF speech on a $15 minimum wage bill, a claim and warrant together would sound like, so first, pass this bill because it reduces income inequality, and that's because it increases wages for low-income workers. Like all arguments, in Congress, every claim you make needs to be backed up with data, which is just evidence you use to support your point. As a rule of thumb, you always want to have at least two sources per speech, and at least one for each point. But to convincingly prove most points, you need more than one piece of evidence. Most top-level debaters cite anywhere between three and five cards per speech, but you usually don't want to go over that or you're gonna run out of time. So on this income inequality contention, I could say, Benjamin Litwin of Gettysburg College found in the spring of 2015 that above $11.77 an hour, every $1 increase in the hourly minimum wage decreases income inequality by 1.3%. If you want to learn more about data, please watch our video on the theory of evidence. The impact is the final thing you say in your contention, and it's the reason why people should care about your point. This is where you can really show off your style and make people connect with you by painting a picture of the real-world people affected by the legislation. So for example, an impact on this income inequality point I've been semi-accidentally setting up could look like this bill is for the kid feeling the sting of hunger in his belly, shivering scared at the thought of sleeping on the streets because his mom with a full-time job still makes poverty wages. Now these four things, claim, warrant, data, impact, they have to be in every speech. But they aren't the only things that have to be in every speech. Between the warrant, each card, and the impact, you need to make space for analysis or refutation. These are just what they sound like. Analysis is your explanation of how each point in the contention interlinks, and refutation is just responding to what other people in the round are saying. Analysis has to be in every point, and refutation has to be in every speech except the authorship. This is congressional debate, after all. Each contention should round out to about a minute and 10 seconds, for reasons I'll get into in a moment. Next, let's move on to the intro and the conclusion. I bring these up at the same time because in Congress, it's a good idea to interlink them. Your intro should have three key things, a hook, a bridge, and a thesis. The hook is often called the attention grabbing device or AGD because the goal of a hook is to hook the attention of your audience. Let's pretend for a second like both points in my minimum wage speech were about income inequality. A good hook would be, we live in a nation of hypocrites. Because we have the audacity to call ourselves the greatest country in the world, while allowing our own citizens to work full-time jobs and still live in poverty. From there, you have to add a bridge, which explains why you just chose your hook and connects it to the debate. So, continuing on my hook, In the face of such disparity, inaction is inexcusable, making this bill imperative. Using the bridge, your hook should link into your thesis, which is just a concise statement of your argument followed by a call to action, specifically to either pass or fail the legislation. So a thesis on this intro would look something like, to close the American gap between haves and have-nots, we have to pass this bill. The entire intro should take no more than 30 seconds, which is a totally reasonable time limit. Like that entire intro I used as an example was 28 seconds. Now your conclusion should do two things. It should link back to the intro and offer a call to action. Again, to pass or fail the legislation. So for that intro, a good conclusion would be, the solution to the hypocrisy of American poverty is democracy. Pass this bill. That conclusion's good because it links back to the hypocrisy hook I made and it includes that final call to action. Your conclusion should be short and sweet, no more than 10 seconds max. So overall, you should spend 30 seconds on the intro, a minute and 10 seconds on each contention, and 10 seconds on the conclusion. That adds up to three minutes exactly. Now, there's a reason I showed you these parts of the speech in this specific order. You shouldn't write your intro until you write your points, 
because you don't know what your thesis will be until you know what your points are. And you can't write your conclusion until you have an intro to link back to. Now, once you write your speeches, you're going to need to practice them. If you have coaches or teammates, get feedback from them. If you have family who will listen to your speech, get some insight. Some of my best tournament placements have been the result of arguments that my parents helped me refine. And of course, spend plenty of time practicing in the mirror. And you want to use a mirror if you have access to one, because it allows you to evaluate not just the sound of your voice, but also your body language. Of course, mastering how to construct each and every part of the speech takes time and practice. In fact, we have a lot of videos in the database dedicated to just one part of the speech structure. But this should give you a good baseline to get started writing speeches. So now you've researched all your legislation, you've prepped and practiced all your speeches, and you're ready to get into your chamber. If you have the chance, get there early. This will give you the chance to start talking with the members of your chamber. And you want to be friendly to your chamber, not just because you'll make lifelong friends all around the country, but also because Congress is political. Your ability to win depends at least a little bit on how the people in your chamber vote. So if your chamber likes you, you'll have a bit of an easier time in rounds. But of course, before the round starts, you'll also talk with the chamber about the docket or the order in which you will debate your chamber's legislation. Because in most tournaments, you get to vote on what that docket will be. You'll also talk about who's going to serve as the presiding officer, or PO. The PO is the debater who gavels, chooses speakers and questioners, times speeches, and runs the chamber. And like the docket, you get to vote on who the PO is going to be. If you want to learn more about the PO, check out our presiding lecture. Your chamber will have at least one judge, but there are usually two or more. Some tournaments have a special kind of judge called a parliamentarian, or parley for short. The parley stays in the room for all sessions and helps the PO run the chamber. Once the round starts, someone needs to make a motion, which is a formal request for the chamber to take action. In order to be considered by the chamber, all motions need to be seconded, which means at least one other person needs to voice agreement with the motion. Also, just a note, don't try to third, or fourth, or fifth emotion, like that's not a thing. It's okay, and in fact even common, for a motion to have more than one second. The first motion that needs to be made is a motion to open the floor for docket nominations. At this point, people can nominate as many docket orders as the chamber is willing to second, and the first docket to get simple majority support wins. Then, a motion needs to be made to open the floor for PO nominations. At this point, people can nominate as many POs as the chamber is willing to second, and the first PO to get simple majority support wins, and they serve for one session. A session is the word we use in Congress to describe a full round of debate. In the preliminary rounds, or prelims for short, which are the first rounds people compete in at a tournament, you'll compete in anywhere between two and four sessions. Sessions usually last about three hours apiece, which usually leaves enough time for debates on two or three pieces of legislation. Once the PO takes the chair, they should explain their gaveling procedure. Now, the reason POs gavel is to give you time signals. It lets you know how much time you have left in your speech. The standard gaveling procedure is one tap at two minutes, two taps at 2.30, three taps at 2.55, and then from 3.05 to 3.10, progressively gaveling louder until the chamber literally can't hear you! It's okay if a PO deviates from this a little bit, but if they vary like crazy, you should make a point of inquiry, a motion which gives you permission to ask the PO a question, and ask if they can bring their gaveling procedure closer to the expected standard so that you know what to expect when you go up to speak. The PO should also let you know that they're going to start by picking speakers and questioners completely randomly. This doesn't mean that you'll randomly get selected to give a speech or ask a question that you don't want to give or ask. It just means that the PO selects from among the people who stand for a speech randomly. This way, no one is given priority to speak because of favoritism, and no one is disadvantaged because they don't have an in with the PO. If the PO says they intend to start by picking speakers another way, say for example by geography, or where people happen to be sitting in the room, or by first standing, where the person who can stand the fastest gets the speech, you should make something called a point of order, a motion which allows you to point out an error the PO made, and point out that random selection is the only method allowed by the rules of the National Speech and Debate Association, or NSDA the governing body of American speech and debate, which sets the rules for congressional debate nationwide. This is important even if you can stand faster than other competitors or you're sitting in a good place, because it's unfair to gain an advantage 
just because you sat down in the right place or were put there by a computer. And it's especially unfair to people with physical disabilities if a PO gives people who can stand quickly an advantage. Congressional debate is not an athletic activity. Once the PO explains their procedures, they open the floor for debate. And at this point, the debating finally starts. The debate starts with the first bill on the docket. The PO will start by calling for an authorship or sponsorship speech, which is the first speech on a given piece of legislation. The only difference between an authorship and a sponsorship speech is that an authorship is delivered by the person who wrote the bill, while a sponsorship is delivered by anyone who happens to be speaking first. As we discussed earlier, in this first debate, standing speakers are chosen completely at random. The only exception is if the bill you're debating was authored by someone in the chamber. Then that person gets something called authorship privilege, meaning that they can give the first speech on their bill no matter who else wants to. The debate bounces back and forth between the AF and the NEG, so after an AF speech, there's a NEG speech, then an AF speech, then an EG speech, and then so on. If no one stands up for a given side, that side can be skipped, meaning that any number of speakers on the same side can speak in a row. And this is what happens when you get an AF heavy or a NEG heavy debate, like I was saying before. When you get a chance to speak, and you walk up and get ready to deliver, introduce yourself along with whatever identifying information the judges need. Usually this involves something called a school code. It's also a good idea to throw in a cute way for judges to remember your name, because it can help judges remember your name, and it makes you more likable. So when I used to walk up, I said, my name is Jack Fitzgerald, last name spelled like the Gatsby author. And then make sure all your judges are ready before you speak. You would not believe the amount of paperwork judges have to fill out before you speak. After you finish speaking, you'll have to go through something called cross-examination, or cross for short, where other speakers in the room get to ask you questions about your speech. You also get to do this to speakers throughout the round. And there are two kinds of cross-examination you could face. The first is called indirect cross, where each questioner can only ask one question, and the speaker only provides one answer. The second is called direct cross, where the speaker and the questioner are allowed a 30 second block where they can interrupt each other and go back and forth in whatever manner they please. At any point in the debate, someone can propose an amendment, a legislative proposal to amend the legislation. Though this is rare and it's usually not recommended unless it serves a strategic purpose. If the amendment is ruled to be germane or appropriate by the PO, and the amendment gets seconded by a third of the chamber, then a whole new debate starts on the amendment. And debate on an amendment ends the same way that debate on legislation ends. Someone makes a motion to move the previous question, which moves to voting on the amendment or the legislation with a two-thirds majority. Now, it's common courtesy to not move the previous question until everyone who wants to speak on a piece of legislation has gotten the chance to speak. Because imagine if you had a speech that you had spent hours preparing to give, and then just because you ended up being picked near the end of the debate, the chamber decided, eh, we don't need to hear them. But sometimes you don't get a choice. Some tournaments put time limits on the amount of time you're allowed to speak on a piece of legislation. And if that's true for your tournament, once you hit that time limit, the PO is required to immediately end the debate without a motion and go straight to voting. Once voting ends on the legislation, you usually take something called a recess, which is a break with a specified time. Recesses can be taken at any point in the session, but they're usually taken at the end of a debate. However, if you're running out of time in your session and taking a recess could prevent someone from speaking, don't take a recess because you don't want to take that opportunity away from somebody. Now, I mentioned earlier that the PO should be selecting speakers randomly at first, but later in the session, the PO is supposed to use a system called recency, a system which prefers the speaker who first has given the fewest speeches, and second, the speaker who spoke the longest time ago. Recency is a big part of Congress, so if you want to learn more about recency, check out our presiding lecture. There's a special kind of motion you can make if you need to move from your seat at some point in the session, and it actually isn't called a motion. It's called a point of personal privilege, and there are three that you can always make. You can make a point of personal privilege to exit the chamber, to enter the chamber, or to move about the chamber. So you don't say motion to go to the bathroom or motion to go get a tissue. You make a point of personal privilege. You need the chair's permission to do any of these things, except in absolute emergencies. And you should also never make any of these motions while someone is speaking or being asked questions. Think about how you would feel if you were interrupted like that. There's also a fourth point of personal privilege you can sometimes make, depending on what kind of chamber you're in. 
If you're in an open chamber, you can make a point of personal privilege to address the chamber, which allows you to talk to the chamber to get feedback, usually to plan out who's going to speak on what side. In a closed chamber, this point of personal privilege isn't allowed. Also, when you speak to or about anyone in your round while the chamber is in session, be sure to refer to people by their proper titles. You can be in either a house or a senate, just like a real congress. If you're in a house, refer to your fellow competitors as representatives. If you're in a senate, refer to them as senators. You do this for two reasons. First, it shows your respect for your fellow competitors and the competition itself. But second, it also can help to prevent misgendering. Now, you don't have to refer to people by their official titles when you're outside of the session. Like if you're in recess, for example, and you needed to get my attention, it would be okay to call me Jack and not Senator Fitzgerald. After you debate all your bills or run out of time, the PO moves the chamber into orders of the day, which calls on the chamber to make any last remaining votes and to finally end the session. And then you rinse and repeat this whole process for however many sessions there are in prelims. So now you've done all your debating and your sessions are over, there's still a couple things left to do. If you're at a local, you wait for the award ceremony to learn if you were one of the top competitors in your chamber. But if you're at a bigger tournament without rounds, or rounds you can advance to if you're one of the top competitors in your prelim chamber, you'll have to wait to see if you advance, also known as breaking. If you did good, there's a chance you can advance to the next round, and just in case, you have to prepare the legislation for those sessions in advance too. If you don't break to the next round, that's okay. We all have our bad tournaments, and we all face results that we don't like. In my experience, these kinds of results can help us most to grow. And if you don't break, one of the things you should do is watch out rounds. Learn from the competitors who were good enough to advance to the next stage of the tournament. In fact, you should watch as many out rounds as you can get your hands on, because every single speech you watch can give you new ideas about how to improve yourself. When the tournament all wraps up, you'll get something back called ballots, which contain your speech scores, your comments, and your ranks. All your speeches are scored, usually on a one to six scale. But honestly, these scores don't really matter. Every judge ranks their top eight competitors in the round, and it's the ranks, not the speech scores, which decide whether or not you break. In fact, I've had judges who've given me a three on a speech and then ranked me first in the round. You can also learn a lot by reading your judge comments, where the judges give you advice on what went right and what went wrong over the course of your speech. Some comments are more helpful than others, but if a comment makes sense, take it into account. If you've gotten this far, it sounds like you're ready to try out Congress. I'm excited for you to become a part of our community, and I can't wait for you to experience all the awesome benefits Congress will have on your mind, your career, and your life. Welcome to Congress.